What the Tech is brought to you by Storyblocks. Storyblocks video gives you studio quality 4K stock video without blowing your budget. Two words, unlimited downloads. To find out more, go to storyblocks.com slash what the tech. For $20 off your first order and the ultimate barbecue bundle for free, go to butcherbox.com slash Andrew and enter Andrew at checkout. That's two New York strips, baby back ribs, two pounds of ground beef free in your first order, plus $20 off. And buy Netgear. When was the last time you upgraded your home's Wi-Fi? Turn your Wi-Fi up a notch with Netgear's new line of Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6 routers. Whether you're gaming online or watching Netflix in 4K, you'll enjoy buffer-free streaming with zero lag, no matter how many devices you're connecting to the network. To get more information, go to netgear.com slash Wi-Fi 6. Make your Wi-Fi feel young again. Hey everybody, welcome to What The Tech. I'm Andrew Zarian, and of course I'm joined by Mr. Paul Therat. Paul, where in the world are you today? <laughs> uh, I'm in a really cheap hotel in Miami Beach. In Miami Beach. Uh, are you enjoying the trip? You were in Miami yesterday, you were posting a lot of stuff. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm glad you and Brad are having a great time <laughs> gallivanting I, I all sense... around Miami. Going to rooftops, going to clubs, having my ties. I get it. I'm glad. I'm happy for you too. It doesn't seem like you are. I, I <laughs> sense a slight frustration. Uh, you're in Miami for what? Vimon. Vimon. Yeah, Vimon's annual trade show. Yeah, I, I, you did not tell me that you were going away. I think. Or you yeah. did, and neither one of us remember informing each other yep. <laughs> about our plans. Uh, but it I don't. So re- yeah, I don't. Yeah, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, I get it. But there is a lot to talk about. I I do actually want to talk about something you did on the trip, and that's take a photo with the uh, the Pixel Three A of Brad. Mm-hmm. Uh, blown right, away right. by this. That that. Yep. You know, three hundred forty nine dollars. By the way. Sorry, uh, you would be more blown away if you understood how dark it was when I took that photo. Like it, it is, it was just pure black. Like it was darkness. You so, know? is and, it posted anywhere publicly that somebody could go yeah, and look? It's, uh, it's, it's a great example I, of the ability of that camera. Well, I mean, it's on. It's in my review on the website. Oh, it is um, okay. on Threat.com. and I think Brad put it on his Instagram account. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. That's probably where I saw it. So, um. It, Really, really, I, I do want to take time and talk about this, obviously, because mm-hmm. there's a lot to discuss with this phone. And, you know, it, yeah. our, this is I'm not saying it's a disruptor. Right. But technically, it could be considered that because you are getting a key feature. And I know a lot of people keep saying, like, well, camera's not important to me. But it's not just the camera. It's the mm-hmm. um, the, the the concept, the, per, the, 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 per, the perception that a, a very inexpensive variant I'm using hand quotes for people that are listening to this very Mm -hmm. inexpensive phone having a first class camera or first class anything on it there's nothing like this in that price range nothing in fact even if you spend a thousand dollars on a phone depending on what you get uh this is a superior camera experience overall for sure yeah yeah, uh, I do want to I do want to talk about this and a whole lot more, but I do want to welcome a new sponsor to the show. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about this because I have been discussing the the troubles of Wi-Fi that I've been having. Uh, Paul knows uh, that how my house is kind of set up. It's set up in a way that it's almost impossible. If I close the, the doors here, it's almost impossible for the Wi-Fi to kind of get to the get to the rest of the house because it's right behind me um paul you rewired recently right and this was a big deal uh, for you or you did you yeah did the, fair, um, fairly recently yeah fairly recently um it, it's it's actually we've, we've come to the point that we have to kind of start thinking about rewiring uh and and upgrading our products because really when is the last time that you updated your wi-fi system it's not something that a lot of people are thinking about but it has changed. Technology has improved uh, overall in general, for especially for Wi-Fi. 
Uh, you can take your Wi-Fi up a notch with Netgear's new line of Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6 routers. So that's the important thing. These are Wi-Fi 6 routers. Uh, there's a whole lot of information on there. Obviously, you can go to netgear.com slash Wi-Fi 6 to learn more. I don't want to sit down and lecture you on the importance of this. But the fact that we all have uh, smartphones and laptops and TVs and all these things are connecting to Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is the future, and it's here. I I was a big... Did you ever hang on to that concept of having to wire everything? A what? Wiring everything. Like, I was one of these guys that was like, I'm not, Wi-Fi is not ready. I'm not going to, I'm just running lines up and down through and through my house. And uh, really, you know, that kind of logic, this kind of logic for most people have has kind of gone away where everything is depending on Wi-Fi. Uh, with Wi-Fi 6 routers from Netgear, the Nighthawk, uh, you get ultra fast speeds, wider coverage throughout your entire house. I actually have it here. I have my Wi-Fi router here. This was hooked up. I disconnected it so I could show you guys this router. Uh, I had it behind me. I'm actually mounting it outside of my studio. But even within the studio, I was able to reach my attic. Uh, and this is from my own personal experience, my attic and my backyard. And that is an impossible, impossible uh, you know, feature for any of the routers that I've had previously. Because it just, it's, it, that's just how the house is. It's built the way that you know, it, it's just set up. Uh, you can stream your shows on services like Netflix and Hulu and not worry about lag or, or, or latency or buffering or any of these issues. This is a great product. Uh, I'm going to have more of a video when I actually mount this outside because I got to drill some holes and stuff. But it's totally in and, and the back end, too. You could do so much with it. It's very customizable. And there's an app. You could also see you know, via your phone, iOS and Android, uh, what's happening with your network. If you could log in, change settings, things like that. Turn your Wi-Fi up to 6 with Net Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6 routers. Go to netgear.com slash Wi-Fi 6. I'm going to have more information on this once I uh, reconnect it on this side. I spent about 30 minutes setting this up. I mean, but we have a little bit of a complicated thing like with uh, we need to have port forwarding, things like that. But it was so simple and plug and play. Uh, if you're just connecting this within minutes, you're up and running. I want to thank Netgear for supporting the show. So, Paul... Uh, let's talk about this phone. How, how has the experience been for you? Um, I actually, before, I should just preface this, um, when the, when the Google announced this phone, I had just gotten the three XL, which is the thousand dollar, you know, flagship that they have. I only bought it because it was on a one day. I think it was, uh, I think it coincided with mother's day. That doesn't seem right, but it was it co what it coincided was was the anniversary of Google Fi, which for some reason I'm tying to Mother's Day, but uh, for some reason that one day they had a half off sale, and I thought, okay, for this much money, I'll get the flagship, you know, whatever. And and you know, it's got a great camera. It's got basically the same camera system as the newer phone, a much higher end processor. Uh, mu uh, you can get more storage. Um, it has wireless charging and some other things that the three A and three A XL are missing, whatever. And so when the 3A was announced at Google I.O., I thought, well, I don't, I don't need to get one of these, and this is not really, you know, important to me, whatever. And I was kind of blown away by the reviewers who had gotten the device early, like how universally positive they were. And I was thinking to myself, have these people forgotten about all the reliability problems that Google's had with every single pixel they've ever released with, you know, how terrible in many ways the 3XL is, and how could this thing possibly with its lower end specifications you know measure up in any meaningful way and uh, I kind of thought about it a bit and then the, what the reason I pulled the trigger was because I have a 2xl still and if I sold that to uh, you know gazelle or Amazon or whatever I think the price was maybe 125 dollars on trade but if I trade it into Google which I'm doing I, I uh, it's off the top of my head but I believe it was 275 that's great and yeah. I thought to myself man this phone is less than Five hundred dollars, I could essentially get it for about two hundred bucks. I think it's two hundred and five or two hundred and ten dollars. And I thought, well, you know, at that price, I mean, my God, take the chance. Who cares? And the thing that's interesting is this thing, this phone, this cheaper phone. It's literally half the price, right, of the Pixel Three XL. Is a nicer phone. It has. I like the body material better. It's made of polycarbonate rather than glass and metal. Um. The camera is the same, like I said, with some uh, with some uh, minor things, which we can discuss. 
uh, and it solves some of the problems that I had with the 3XL. So one of the big ones was, actually, they're all audio related when I think about it. Um, if you sit there and watch a movie or play music or whatever through the stereo speakers on the 3XL, the sound is actually pretty rich and deep. It's, it's got a nice sound uh, kind of quality to it. But because of the construction of the device, which is glass front and back, I think, uh, or I think it's because of that, there's an echo and a vibration. When you hold the phone in your hand as it's playing audio, it actually vibrates with the audio. Oh, wow. And there's an echo that you can literally hear uh, as if the sound is echoing around inside of the device, which actually I think it is. It's also heavily biased toward the non-notch side of the two speakers, meaning that the stereo is a little, it, it's, you can tell it's very focused to the side. It's not truly centered or, you know, it's not equal yeah. on either side. Um, the 3A XL has uh, stereo speakers as well. They're not front, well, the bottom or the rightmost one is not front firing like they are in the 3XL. The sound quality is not quite as deep and rich, but the stereo separation is perfect. It's exactly center, you know, or uh, balanced. There is no echo, there's no vibration, and that's just better. But the, the bigger audio problem I've had is with phone calls. Um, every time I make or receive a phone call on my end in the earpiece, you can hear as soon as the call connects, a, there's a static. This it's is like on a, the this like, is on the uh, the Pixel Three, the more expensive one. Okay, and it it's just you know it's a staticky sound, and it, it it persists for the entire duration of the call. As soon as you end the call, it goes away. When I call other people, sometimes not always, but sometimes, and with my wife, most times. Uh, she said that I sounded mechanically garbled and she could barely hear me many times. And it's one of those frustrating things. You almost get in a fight with her because she can't hear anything you're saying and you're getting kind of mad and it's like, why isn't this working and and whatever. So when I switched to the 3A XL, you know, I switched over to the, the wireless network, uh, you know, to Google Fi and I'm using this phone as my phone. I called her and I didn't tell her I had made the switch. And she said, hey, you sound great. What did you change? Oh. I was like, I'm like, she noticed immediately. Now, I, you, I noticed on my end. Do you think it's mm -hmm. a defect on your phone or do you think this is a... Um, no, if you go, uh, Android Police has an issues tracker for the 3XL and this is one of the commonly reported problems is oh, garbled micro microphone. Um, I think it's a, a hardware problem and I think they fixed it in the 3A XL. And so when I connect on a phone call now, there's no static. It's just the call just starts. It's normal. It's one of those things you shouldn't have to celebrate, but when you've been yeah. putting up something that doesn't work, uh, it's a pro, you know, that's a problem. And my wife immediately, like I said, I didn't even tell her I did it. Um, she said she immediately noticed how much better it sounded. And so, you know, here we have this phone that's again, is half the price, right? It solves some problems for me, certainly. Um, it doesn't have some things, right. That you get in the more expensive phone. The screen isn't quite as high of a resolution. It's, not, it's, it's a full gorilla, HD plus versus quad. Not gorilla glass either. It's not Gorilla Glass protected. It uses some other Japanese uh, manufacturers' glass hardening material. Actually, I should say it's 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 scratch protection, not hardening, so much as Gorilla Glass is both. And so, if you if you're familiar with Gorilla Glass, they're on you know Generation Five. I think it's actually Generation Six now. Um, this glass that they have is supposedly the equivalent of Gorilla Glass two or three. So it's it's just not as good. Um, and so you get, you know, obviously you always want a case, I, you know, who knows long-term, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen over time with scratch, you know, maybe you put it in your pocket with keys and it's right. You know, I, I haven't experienced any scratches yet, but that's something I'll, I'll obviously be paying attention to. Um, it has a mid range processor, right? A 670, a Snapdragon 670 versus a Snapdragon 855. If you look at it on benchmarks, it looks like it's about, you know, two thirds of the performance of the higher end chip, mm -hmm. but you know, in day-to-day, -day, what I would call normal phone usage, I have not experienced any performance issues at all, except for two that I will highlight that I think are important to note. Um, but you can even play games like um, Asphalt, the latest Asphalt racing game, um, which I think, you know, obviously is mobile, you know, is a mobile uh, performance oriented or whatever, but it runs great. There are no glitches, there's no hitches, there's no little stutters, whatever, it works great. Um, if you're a gamer, you're not going to want this one. You, you know, if you want to play PUBG or, or Fortnite or whatever, you're probably going to want a, a higher end phone. But uh, day to day, this thing is is wonderful. I only see performance issues in two places, and I do see them regularly. I don't consider it either to be a huge problem. Um, one is when you're taking certain kinds of photos with the camera. So anything that requires 
background processing of the image where there's some kind of AI thing going on. Uh, Night Sight is a great example of this, where, you know, the picture you were talking about with Brad, where I took a picture of Brad on, the, uh, on a dark beach at night with no real direct lighting, no flash or anything. And what it does is, uh, well, first, night, night light has its own, night sight, I'm sorry, has its own um, way of doing things where you hold it up, you press the thing, and the, uh, a kind of a progress circle occurs. And it tells you to hold it steady because what it's really doing is taking a bunch of photos that it's going to combine into a single thing. I, I have that a process, for you, actually, uh, about that. Okay. Um, the picture <laughs> yep. that you posted, what resolution did you take it in? Oh, just whatever whatever the six megapixels whatever, whatever it is, it is. Okay. i didn't change anything okay no yeah, no, no because i was looking on the website if it it looks a little compressed on the website so i don't know if that's because it's under low oh light. it could be because i posted it but it's you know look it's um it's probably going to be less clear I, I, some of the pictures i took at night with the night site were a little blurry right it, it relies on people not moving uh it's not going to be good for action scenes because you like i said you have to hold it there and it kind of does this thing but although i will say interestingly with that brad shot while I while I started taking that, because it was, you know, it takes, let's say it takes five seconds. The other people we were with noticed me taking the picture and ran to try to bomb it. And they they arrived in time to be at the end. And I thought, we're going to have to take this one again because those people have screwed it up. But because it combines all the photos, it got rid of that part of it because oh, they were noise me? or motion. Wow. And so that picture you see is something that it the exactly. AI processing kind of put it together. So, but... In a night sight shot, there are two uh, periods of time where you know processing occurs. So the first one is when you're taking it, and that takes, like I said, maybe five seconds. It's a little slower on the three A XL than it is on the three XL. That makes sense, right? It's it 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 you know it's a little bit slower. After you're done taking the photo, it might take three to five seconds for it to process, so you can see the final result. That's a couple seconds longer than it is on the three XL, but you know. Who cares? <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever. Um, the other one is because I'm like a 52 year old, you know, white male or whatever, and I'm just never going to be able to type on my phone. I've really started to use the transcription capability on the virtual keyboard. And so if I'm sending a text message, especially, I'll hit the little microphone icon and I'll speak and it will transcribe it into the box. And then I hit enter and it goes to, you know, whatever, if it's my wife, my daughter, Brad, whatever it is. And on the three, XL, I never really paid attention to it because the performance was so fast. But on the 3A XL, I noticed immediately and every single time that every time I started recording that way or transcribing that way, it would miss the first couple of words I said, which is infuriating, by the way. And so you start, I started paying attention to it. And what happens is it actually comes up and it says, if you look at it, because you don't really see it on a faster phone, but there's a little message box that says initializing dot, dot, dot. And it sits there for like, on the 3AXL, it sits there for like a second or two. And then it says start start now or start recording or whatever it says. Um, that delay does not occur on the Pixel 3XL because it's faster. But because this one is kind of a more mid-range processor or whatever, you actually have to look at it and wait, you know. And so I, it's something I notice every time. I, I don't think it's a deal breaker, but it's, you know, I think this is an indication of that performance. Well, I find that interesting because... Um... My father uses that, right? Like my father's mm-hmm. vision is really bad, and yeah, he has, yeah, it's it's an eye condition, it's the whole thing. But he um he uses text to speech all the time, mm-hmm. and I I actually I read somebody else was talking about that the text to speech is kind of delayed. Uh, so I used my father's, and I was talking on the iPhone six. It's very fast. So right. I'm curious right. why in the iPhone this is a better processor than that. I'm I'm imagining, right? How many generations you're talking three genera four generations old of a phone? Five? Yeah, but if you were to take iOS, you know, thirteen or twelve or whatever, and put it on an iPhone five S or something, or five or a six, uh, maybe that wouldn't be so fast. And I think that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. This is not the latest processor, right? It it also yeah. doesn't have Google's Pixel Visual Core AI chip, you know. So these things combined might be imp- or, or are impacting the performance here and there. But day to day launch uh, app launches, you know, app usage, game playing, like I said, I, nothing is nothing. And those two things I just mentioned are not big deals. I mean, it's it's not. This is not a problem. It's just something to know. I mean, if this, you know, if you have to have 
the absolute top of the line performance, you can spend another 480 bucks <laughs> and get, you know, get a, get a faster phone. But I mean, I, I honestly dated the, I preferred this phone overall to the three XL. It's a better phone. So I think, I think the, uh, another comparison that we need to make is in its market, right in that, mm -hmm. in that mid range Android market for $349. What is it competing with and how do they perform perform? I'm willing to bet that for three hundred and forty nine dollars, you're not really getting something you know, that performs at this level. Yeah, so the phones to look up if you go to the Motorola website, for example, uh yeah. there's a Moto G line of phones uh that falls into this price range and lower. You know, they have different versions of it. It's the type of thing, it's a lot like if you remember the Lumia 830, um, a lot of these Moto phones have that, yeah. like, it looks like it has a giant camera on the back because it's like a giant black circle, but really the camera's just in the middle of that. And what they're really doing is cheating by bringing out a camera bump so they can fit more internals in there, but it's not any better of a camera. Um, those phones will have low and mid range processors. They'll have small amounts of RAM. They'll have small amounts of storage. They'll have some advantages. I mean, they might support wireless charging in some cases. They might support um, uh, storage expansion and so forth. But the camera quality on those phones is garbage. It's just garbage. Yeah, I'm just I'm on Amazon right now to see what's available. Samsung Galaxy A50 289. Uh, yeah. You get an S9 449. Yeah, no, you can yeah. listen. I, the, the Apple approach, you know, buy yesteryear's phone at a cheaper price. You can do that. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. I, but this is a brand new phone. It is stylistically very similar, identical, really, to the 3XL. Um, I, it has a polycarbonate body, which I actually prefer. It doesn't have wireless charging, which might be a downer for some. It's not truly water resistant. Like you said, it does not have Gorilla Glass. Yeah. I mean, there's things to know about for sure. They have to cut corners in some areas. Um, but the overall experience, you know, first of all, clean Android, which I love. It's go completely Google Fi compatible, which I love because I use Google Fi. Camera quality for me is job one. It's excellent. Um, you know, it doesn't. There's a. It doesn't have the uh, the three XL has two cameras on the front to enable a super wide selfie mode. This one has only one, so it's just normal selfies. It's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's eight megapixels on the front. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have visual, uh, uh, pixel visual core, which I believe is at the heart of the performance slowdown when it's processing uh, night sight and other types of photos. But again, uh, in real world, just actually using it side by side, you know, I've taken pictures in my house in the dark. I've taken pictures outside at night. The pictures from this phone are identical to the ones from the 3XL for all intents and purposes. I mean, obviously there could be slight variations based on me moving a little or, you know, slightly different positioning, whatever it is. But um, they are the same photos, the same camera. So yeah, it takes a little longer to process, but like, who cares? The processing happens behind the scenes. I mean, it might, you may, maybe have to wait a second to look at it or whatever. Like, it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's not a $480 big deal. That's for sure. Um, so I, I think it matters, you know, it depends on your needs. Everyone has different needs. If wireless charging is job one for you for some reason or whatever, um, or whatever some other missing feature is. I mean, yeah, okay. Maybe it's not for you, but I love that this option exists. I hate that smartphones are a thousand dollars. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I've I point to previous Google phones. The Nexus Five was a great example of like a phone that was in this price class or cheaper for the day and was a flagship phone for the day. Had a good camera for the day. Uh, was a wonderful phone. And then phones like the Nexus Five X and the Six P, which were absolutely flagship quality phones, probably in this price range a little bit more. Uh, and then the equivalent of those phones today are $1,000. And I, I just don't understand how did this escalate, you know, to this price range? I don't know. Uh, but this is an acceptable compromise. And uh, I think for most people, this is a great phone. It's a much better phone than like that Samsung, whatever you said, or the, the Moto G or whatever, these kind of mid-range to low-end phones. This is a great phone. And it's a great, not just for the price. It's just a great phone. I'm going to... You know, I, I test phones. I mean, I'm going to move on. I've got a Huawei phone to test. I've got a, a, a OnePlus 7 Pro to test. But, you know, right now, my inclination would be to stick with this one. Like, I, I prefer this to the 3XL. Yeah, I'm ordering it. Um, I just got to remember to order it. I keep forgetting. But I'm very interested oh, in this. I should, I should mention um, yeah. one other limitation of this. And this, this, this might be the only... This is the one thing that kind of bugs me. It's the one thing where I'm like, yeah, it's not that great. Um, you can only order this phone with 64 gigs of storage. It's not expandable. There is no option for getting 128. If there was, I would have gotten that. Um, 
And so that that could be a problem for people. I've been kind of keeping track of my storage usage. The problem's going to arrive when it fills up with photos. In fact, I took the phone away. I can't look. But I bet if I were to look at the 3XL and see how much storage space those photos were using up and then add that to where I'm at with the 3AXL, just to kind of, you know, if I had been using this all along, I bet I'd be getting pretty close to the top. Like it's, I might, because of the sheer number of photos I take, I might have to start thinking about offloading them at some point between the, you know, the photos, the, um, you know, audiobooks and music and whatever else I download to the device. But again, this is, it depends on who you are and how you use a phone. It might not be a problem for you, but um, that's maybe the one thing that's not, I wish they, I wish they had an option. You know, about three years ago, I would have told you 64 gigs is more than enough. But in reality, uh, because the photos have gotten so bloated, right? The size of photos, yeah. because it's allowing, yeah, yeah. it's a higher level of photography mm -hmm. on these things. A photo could be like eight megs, depending. Yeah. So I, one thing you could do on this phone, I just never have to think about this. So I never, I never done, I've never done this. Um, obviously with Google, uh, yeah, if you, well, is this Google Fi specific? Hmm. I'm gonna, I said obviously, but it's not obvious. So I don't know if it's Google Fi or just through the Pixel. I think it's through the Pixel. You get uh, unlimited storage on Google Photos. It must be through the Pixel. So um, the size of the photo is under the size that they would start minimizing, the, you know, stripping the photos down. So you could get unlimited storage on this for some number of years, and you could offload them to the cloud. I mean, that's one thing you could do, right? You and then 64 good, would probably here's be a question. Fine. I would love there to be, and, and maybe it exists, but I, that I don't know. What I would love, is once I take the photo with the after a week, it removes it from my device and just has it in mm. Google Photos in the cloud. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I don't need that photo to take right. up space on my phone. Just put it in the cloud. Uh, I'm yep. curious why that's not a feature where it automatically deletes the photo. It might it might actually be a feature. So that's what be. I was just thinking yeah. about. I, I've never had to think about it, but that might actually be a feature. Um, Maybe someone knows. I don't know. I, I've, yep. I haven't played around with it because I've really never needed to do it, but that is a... That is a, and if it's not a feature, it's something to consider because, um, like I'll give you an example. My, my iPhone has gotten so bloated because I was using the phone for work and it was a lot of work related images that I had. Yeah. So yeah. it got so bloated where I had to manually go and delete everything. And I mean, I cleaned up, I mean, gigs and gigs of photos within like six months that were, that were on there that I no longer needed. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's something to consider. Uh, I do right. want to talk about Sony and Microsoft. Uh, finding this very interesting. But before we continue, mm -hmm. I want to, of course, thank our great sponsor, one of my favorite sponsors, and that's ButcherBox. Barbecue season is here. Uh, I have been grilling like crazy. This is the first year that I'm really like because I'm back home. I'm working from home now. Uh, I literally grill every other day. Uh, it's also part of my diet where I'm doing less protein. I'm, I'm doing higher protein and I'm doing way less carbs. So grilling works perfectly. And with ButcherBox, here's a great thing. For $20 off your first order and the ultimate barbecue bundle for free, go to butcherbox.com slash Andrew and enter the code Andrew at checkout. And that gives you two New York strips, baby back ribs, and two pounds of ground beef free in your first box plus $20 off. This is great to get the season started. Listen, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's coming up in a couple days. Uh, I, I'm going to be grilling. This is a great way to do it. And the way that this works, uh, they ship it to your house, okay, which is perfect. But you can choose from four curated boxes, including a mix of high-quality grass-fed uh, and grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, heritage-bred pork, or you could customize your box. So if you just want to do uh, beef, you could do beef. If you want to do chicken, you could do chicken. Each box comes with at least 9 to 11 pounds of meat, which uh, is enough for 24 individual serving size meals. So uh, it's phenomenal, right? That's a lot. Uh, the meat is also vacuum sealed and protected. And they know how to package this with proper dry ice. So it doesn't matter if you live in New York or you're in Phoenix, it's it's fine to, to, when it's delivered and it's at your doorstep. 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef means the cattle ate nothing but grass their entire lives. Free-range organic chicken and heritage-bred pork, That's that would be the old world pork. That's what it's called. Also, uh, Alaskan uh, sockeye uh, salmon also if you want to, you know, 
do uh, do fish as well. They got an unbelievable lineup. I'm so excited because I'm I have mine right now. I have a whole bunch that's sitting there, and uh, I'm about to start defrosting these because I I froze them and start cooking them. I've become such a huge fan of these guys, and it's a big hit because I had a party last uh, two weeks ago, and it showed up at my door, and Jess's uh, cousin dragged this box, and she's like, you have this giant box here. What is this? I'm like, oh, that's my meat. Got it delivered. It's fine. <laughs> uh, to find out more, and of course, to place your order, go to butcherbox.com slash Andrew, and you get $20 off your first order and the Ultimate Barbecue Bundle for free. This is a limited time offer. I highly recommend you take advantage of this. Now the grilling season is here. Thank you, ButcherBox, for supporting the show. Um, so Sony's using Azure? <laughs> well, they're exploring it. But yeah, I, I, I think the way this is really going to run uh, turn out is that Sony will end up using uh, Azure and probably AWS or Azure and some Google service or whatever it is. Because, you know, when it comes to the cloud, uh, services and availability and scalability and all that kind of stuff. Um, most big companies are turning to at least two providers, right? N not so much so they can play them off each other, but so that they have redundancy and so forth. But still, when you think about it, um, Sony and Microsoft have been video game console uh, competitors for the entire three generations that Microsoft's been part of uh, video gaming. Um, Microsoft has actually come in last in every one of those generations, but um, that's kind of the irony here because as we move forward to cloud streaming, which is the future of gaming, um, Microsoft is in a unique position to actually kind of dominate that market because they have this infrastructure. Uh, they're based. Uh oh. We lost Paul. Uh, I think he might have lost internet. Oh, there you are. Yep, there it is. Oh, what happened? Yeah, you froze. I don't know where okay. I froze, but... Uh, you were talking about streaming, and then you froze. Yeah, so uh, Microsoft, which has not won any of the console generations in which it's participated, in fact, it's coming last every time, um, is in a unique position to actually dominate the future of gaming because we're going to game streaming. And, you know, when you think about companies like Nintendo has online services, of course, um, but if they, you know, this is going to explode, like this is going to be a much bigger deal than what that company is now offering. Nintendo doesn't have any real presence in this area. Um, and that's why you're starting to see companies like Google and Amazon talk about cloud streaming because they're able to do that stuff. They have the infrastructure. You know, Microsoft is the only company that is in both places today. They make video game consoles. They're a huge participant in the video game market today. and they have this cloud infrastructure. So obviously Microsoft's going to use Azure for their own stuff as well. I always thought that Microsoft would see success with companies like Activision or uh, anyone who has their own kind of online thing, but they're not going to be able to meet the scalability demands of the future with game streaming, could turn to Azure and Microsoft and, and get that from them. I thought that the big win for Microsoft might be if they could partner with Nintendo. Uh, they have a Seattle presence. Um, they have no online anything really in, in any meaningful, scalable way. And I thought that was a natural fit. But the fact that Sony went with them is like, I never would have anticipated that. It says it's something about Amazon, doesn't it? If Sony went with Microsoft well, with this. Uh... They could they could also go with Amazon, by the way. I, I, I don't, This might have got cut off earlier. But um, uh, I believe that Sony will have a second provider as well. Because you need that kind of redundancy and... and, yeah. and uh, just downtime, you know, if, if Azure goes down for a few minutes, you know, you seamlessly switch everything over to, you know, AWS and vice versa, whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't think this is the end of the story, but it is amazing um, that this happened. And I, what's come out since is that the guys who actually work in the PlayStation, you know, organization and Sony were like, what the heck just happened? Like Microsoft and Sony had been talking at a very high level about this for about a year, apparently. They heard nothing about this. They found out about it when the agreement came out. Uh, they didn't realize that they were going to be dependent on Microsoft for their future in some ways. Uh, right now, Sony does streaming with uh, PlayStation yeah. Now, and I think they have yep. almost 800 games on there, right? It's like 780 or 790. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Obviously, this is going to explode over the next generation. Uh, well, that's the thing. I mean, this is, yeah. If you If you look at gaming as a whole, uh, if you look at console gaming as a whole, or if you look at you know just PlayStation gaming as a whole, the part that is game streaming across PS Now is probably three percent or some tiny percent. 
Yeah, uh, the point of this is that in the future, this is going to be gaming. This will be most gaming. Uh, even games that are kind of on your device or computer or whatever will have some streaming component to them. Uh, Sony does not have the ability to scale to meet those needs. And that's the issue. I'm sure what they looked at was, okay, could we build this out? Could we work with some third party to you know build out our own thing? And what they discovered was, no, actually, this the infrastructure exists. There are three, maybe four companies that have it. Um, there are three of them, at least, are, are, have designs on the game world. Microsoft is the one that is, they're already doing, uh, they're going to be doing, well, they're doing a sort of public trials right now with Microsoft employees. Um, they will be doing public trials this fall uh, with everybody. And it's real. And I think they evaluated that. And we're like, okay, this is, you know, it sounds like kind of a, you know, obviously they're competitors, but they're also partners in other ways uh, as well. Where, um, where do you think Microsoft is going to be when it comes to streaming on the next console? Do you think it's going to be at what percentage of gaming do you anticipate this taking over? Right now, it's a very small percentage, obviously. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You is know, there going to be a it, lot of emphasis on this. Yeah. So at at, um, at the build conference, Microsoft talked about how they had four clouds, and if and honestly, going forward, that's going to be the way that you're going to break down Microsoft as a company. They have they're going to have four businesses, four big businesses, and those are going to be those four clouds. You know, one of them's Azure. Um, one of them is their C uh, Dynamics CRM type stuff. Uh, one of them is Microsoft 365, which is Office productivity and Windows and uh, device management. And then the fourth one is gaming. They didn't talk about gaming at all at Build, at least not during the keynote, uh, ex except for a, a very small thing at the end about Minecraft. But I think they were originally intended to announce the Sony deal there. It just wasn't ready. Um, I thought it was really weird that they suddenly started talking about these four clouds because gaming is not a huge cloud for them today. But um, they have spoken about it so much, uh, it's very clear they consider this to be a big part of the future. So if you look at, you know, we don't know exactly what the market's going to break down to look like. But if let's pretend there were five or eight players that, you know, Sony will be in there, my, Nintendo will be in there, Microsoft will be in there with their own services. And then there'll be these newcomers like Google, Stadia, and whatever the Amazon service is, and they'll be, you know, I'm sure the, uh, the big Epic and the game publishers might have, you know, Origin will have their own type of game streaming services, whatever the, whatever it looks like. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that market is Microsoft will have whatever usage or market share that they might have with xCloud, but they're also going to benefit from other services using the, using Azure. So, you know, maybe they come in third place or fifth place or first place. It kind of doesn't matter. Because this Azure thing is going to be the bigger deal, just like the Azure thing is going to be the bigger deal for everything that Microsoft does. Uh, essentially, so that's the future, right? Uh, uh, on, yeah. on all on all fronts, that's their enterprise, that's their consumer, yeah. that's their game. I mean, that's really it's everything, right? So imagine Sony wins the first generation of game streaming. Well, who really won? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, Microsoft arguably might have made more money from that than Sony did or something. You know, I, I it's hard to say, but certainly regardless of who actually technically wins, Microsoft still wins if Sony wins now, which is there, amazing, right? Because a, when Sony wins today, they lose. There's a strange inherent comparison with IBM always when we talk about Microsoft becoming a services company, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But I can't imagine it going down the exact path of IBM in, in the sense that Microsoft is way more open to... You know, with their with their concept of how they're going to work with companies. I'm talking about early, you know, Microsoft is now becoming yeah. a backbone for a lot of these uh, competitors at this point. And they work with Android. It's a very different. It's a shifted company. Do you think that comparison still is fair for Microsoft to compare them to IBM? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, you know, in many ways. Well, because what what Microsoft will become, what they are becoming, what we see this in. Uh, like small ways, you know, uh, BMW, for example, has a, a digital assistant in their vehicle, in their new vehicles. It's based on Cortana. You don't, you will never see a Cortana logo or name. You'll never hear Cortana. Uh, they have their own thing. I don't know what the name of it is. I don't know how you summon it, whatever, but it's based on Cortana. Cortana as an end user facing, you know, interactive digital assistant for normal human beings is a failure, complete failure. But Cortana could have a success on the back end, just like uh, it, like like we see with BMW. Like that's where that stuff kind of makes sense. You could apply that kind of rationale or that kind of um, strategy to everything Microsoft does, or a lot of what Microsoft does. And if you think about it, like I said, with the gaming, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, XCloud could be a complete failure, um, but they're still going to have a big win in video games. 
because not because of the Sony deal, but because of things like the Sony deal. The Sony deal will be part of it, but there will be a ton of companies that rely on Azure to stream games. And because Microsoft is getting in early and has their own video game uh, platform that they have to worry about, this thing will be optimized very quickly and they'll be able to apply that um, to all these other companies and their own services. So yeah, in a way they become, um, you know, it's, it's not Windows Automotive, it's BMW and their own thing, but it's running Microsoft software in the background. You know, it's 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 not Microsoft, you know, that you see, it's not the logo, it's not the brand, but it, they're in there. And that's in that way, they are kind of like IBM, aren't they? They're kind of like electricity or like water. I mean, they're they're just there. They're a service. They're yeah. Yeah, they're there. You may not know they're there, but you know they're there. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, also, there was a demo that Sony did since we were on this topic, uh, showing mm -hmm. uh, it gave some of the specs, obviously, and it showed how how it performs compared to the PlayStation Four Pro. And it's a uh, I think one was a point eighty three second load time, and the other one was an eight second load time. But is this? Uh, you mean this is the next console? This yeah, is like the next the, uh, console. Yeah, the demo. Yeah, because yeah, by the way, so Sony is not dropping consoles, right? I mean, they, you know, even though they're like Microsoft, they're looking at this cloud thing, and that is the future. But that doesn't mean there won't be more consoles. So, Sony has something that will probably be called the PlayStation Five. That's what you're describing. Microsoft has uh, upcoming revisions to the Xbox One that will come out this fall or next fall or whenever. Um, probably multiple revisions that will you know, jack the specs up or whatever. So that still happens. I mean, you know, there's going to be more of that. I mean, and there'll be both for a while. Um, but both companies agree that, you know, the future, when you look at it, it's really heading toward the cloud. I tell you, Nintendo, it's very interesting how uh, they are not gung-ho on jumping on anything. Uh, I, know. I would I have know. imagined, you know, how many years ago did they release that Mario game for iOS and yeah. Android, right? And it it's still kind deal. of the one major thing That's that they've it. done. I know they have a few other games, but um, you know what, though? I, if you think about personal computing in general and you think back, you know, PCs were personal computing for so long and the, the, the world changed, right? And and we talk a lot about cloud computing, but on, honestly, the other side of it is mobile computing. And so it's really mobile and cloud. And, it's, and these two things combined worked to uh, minimize the impact of the PC market and to just change the way that we do things. Um, Sony and Microsoft are heading very much to the cloud, not to mobile. Um, Sony used to have mobile devices, remember, like the PS Vita and so forth. They gave up on that. that uh, I, I thought they were actually pretty great, but they didn't succeed very well against the Nintendo stuff. Microsoft looked at doing a portable Xbox and decided against it. They kind of play around a little bit with PCs as, uh, not PCs, but rather like uh, Surface-type tablets as like kind of a portable gaming thing. But really for them, the future is mobile, but it's other people's mobile platforms. I don't know what Sony's doing there, but um, Nintendo very much has embraced mobile in the sense that their current console is really a mobile device, right? It's something that you dock if you want to use it um, attached to a TV set, but it's something you can take with you and play um, on the go, like on a commute or on a plane or whatever. And, uh, I, I, you know, they have their own approach. They're kind of a goofy, you know, unique company. They're a little bit like Apple. Like you said, you know, they adopt things a little bit late. Um, but they're going to need help on the cloud side. And I think they're going to turn to a Microsoft or an Amazon or Amazon's also in Seattle, by the way, um, or Google or whoever um, for help with that. Uh, but they have a good leg up on the mobile side of it for sure. And that's a big, you know, that's a big chunk of the Absolutely. present and of the future. Yeah. Uh, I do want to talk about something else with you. I'm very excited to mm -hmm. talk to you about this. And I know a lot of, it's been, a, it's been a big topic of conversation over the last couple of days. I, I want to save that to the end. But before we okay. continue, I want to thank our sponsor and that Storyblocks. I uh, love these guys. Storyblocks video gives you studio quality 4K stock video without blowing your budget. Two words, unlimited downloads. Anything in the video member library is yours to download as much as you want, including HD and 4K footage, After Effects templates, motion backgrounds, uh, the list goes on and on for your project. And the way that it works, you can download anything from their audio and image library also. And you get all the sound effects, music, photos that you need with their unlimited all-access plan. Plus, you get exclusive discounts on millions of other uh, other projects in the additional marketplace uh, for clips where you can save on every purchase. But here's the thing. 
it's whatever you're buying, whatever you're using from there, the content is yours to use and you could use it anywhere including YouTube, all content is royalty free for commercial and personal use. This is a big part of this. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that we've worked on a project and then realized that we got a takedown notice. And it's not fun when that happens. These guys are great. There's new clips added every single day, all the time. You could, you could do, depending on what your project is, from anything from a video intro for a podcast to uh, a, a drone footage of the Empire State Building uh, I'm sure it's there. There's tons of tons of stuff on there, and I absolutely love them. To get to get more information and, of course, to sign up, go to storyblocks.com/whatthetech. That's storyblocks.com/whatthetech to learn more about Storyblocks video. Paul, yeah, uh, did you watch Game of Thrones? I did. I want to get your opinion on this. Okay. <laughs> I want to know what you thought of the entire season and what you thought of the ending. Yeah. So. Um... To preface this, let me just tell you that I am extremely critical uh, of everything, really. In fact, it kind of drives <laughs> some of my family members crazy. Yeah, Paul tells um, me to lose weight all the time when he's yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, 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 I sort of defend myself by saying, you know, I'm a. This is what I do for a living, in a way, right? I'm a critic. Um, you know, I review products and so forth, and and I'm very, very, very critical of quality of shows. I mean, um, a lot of the stuff we've watched. In recent years, I mean, there's so much good TV now. I, I, I just won't put up with it. You know, I'll, I'll, we will start to stop watching it. I won't. You're not just, a fan you know, of the Jersey Housewives on Bravo, Paul? No, no, okay. not at all. So here, but, but here's the thing that's in. So with that in mind, I will say, um, not nearly as critical of this last. I would call it two seasons because honestly, the last two seasons of Game of Thrones were completely different from the previous uh, five seasons, whatever yeah. that is, six seasons. Um, they they're. I, I I was so taken with the story that I went and read the books. And the books, it's funny, you know, uh, the first book in that series, that Song of Fire and Ice or whatever it's called by George Martin, is ba roughly it, or parallels the first season of the Game of Thrones. And it is a fantastic book. He has done a thing where he's created this believable world in the same way that Tolkien did. Like, you totally buy into it. Uh, well, um, the books go downhill. You've you've read them all, or oh, I stopped because they go they get terrible. So oh, I don't remember okay. how many. I, yeah, they get terrible. So the second and third, the way I remember it is the second and third books are pretty good, and by the fourth or fifth book, I don't remember exactly where I, I kind of drifted off. There, there's an entire there's a book where the entire first half of it takes place. It's there's like a couple of farmers and they're talking about stuff that's going on with all the important people, and you you end up I the way I described it to my friends at the time was like. You know, I, I always gave this guy a lot of credit, like I just did it, for creating this totally believable world. Like, you believe this place exists. It's, it's got this, everything makes sense. I didn't need to meet every single human being living in this world. And that's what happens in the books. Like, it gets, mm. it's it, it, it veers so wildly out of control. It's it's basically unreadable. Anyone who thinks that this guy is going to finish this series is nuts. They're, they're, he will never finish these books. Uh, he, he has gone so far off the rails. Like, it, they just get ridiculous. They're terrible. He, uh, um, the, the the next book, uh, Winds of Winters, was supposed to be mm -hmm. out already. And yeah, it, I was. Gonna, I thought you were going to say it was supposed to be out this fall, and I'm like, yeah, it's been supposed to be out since 2012 yeah. or something. I, yeah. I'm sure, but anyway. But as far as the series goes, Game of Thrones is obviously um, controversial in some ways. There's a lot of uh, sexual stuff, the, the crazy violence. It's a little bit like The Walking Dead in that you know don't get too attached to anyone because they, they could die at any time. It's a very brutal world, and it's a. But again, you know, within the rules of what this place is and the way it works, and uh, we, we, they, he kind of, uh, or they kind of, through the series, introduce kind of magic back into the world. These things that existed in the past, yeah. like those, uh, the ice walkers or whatever they're called, the um, white walkers. What are they called? White walkers. Yeah. The dragons, you know, and that kind of stuff. Like this stuff comes back. There's a witch, <laughs> you know, yeah. with actual magic. Um, it's it's almost like a it's it's almost like the foundation series if you've ever read the Asimov stuff in that there was stuff that used to be in the past and they're we're trying to bring it back you know that kind of stuff so anyway I I, I the show if you can kind of get through the point you know the uh, gratuitous like pointless sex scenes and and the, the even more brutal stuff that occurs the the really, total disregard for humanity and human life yeah. Yeah, and especially for women, although I, I will say, you know, because a lot of women's groups are up in arms with the way things have turned out in the Game of Thrones, especially. But, um, you know, for a world that is this brutal and for a world that is this brutal to women, 
it is astonishing how many high quality, high power women characters there are in this show. If you go back through it, the whole thing, like it is amazing how yeah. many excellent women characters there are. So yeah, you have Sansa, you I, have Cersei, I hear the, you have Daenerys, you have, uh, you know, uh, the, the Stark's mother. Arya, you've got their yeah, mother, Arya. Caitlin. You've got, I mean, like the, the, I don't remember the names of everyone, but like the, um, the women characters from that kind of island nation that, you know, they're all fighters and everything. The, the, the sister of Greyjoy, who is now leading that group, the, uh, the iron, I forget all the names, but anyway, there's yeah. a lot of women characters and they're great. There's, there's a lot of women, you know, slaves and things like that too. But like, it, it, I think it's notable and important to remember how many great women characters are on the show. So sure. anyway, um, with the understanding that the last two seasons, not just this last season, but the one before it were a completely different cadence, uh, all of a sudden, things are moving quick, you know. Um, there were, are shows that did that, like Lost suffered from the same thing, and I think was a worse show as a result than it needed to be. Um, I actually think they did a great job with the Game of Thrones, and although I can pick apart little things here and there, um, I enjoyed the last season quite a, quite a bit. And I look, this, my wife even said, she's like, I got to say, you know, we watch a lot of shows, like the last show always sucks. Like the Veep just ended. Veep is one of the best shows yeah. that's ever been on TV. It is the funniest, yeah, very like good sharpest. Show. It's like if Aaron Sorkin was a total dick and wrote TV, it would be Veep. Like it's amazing. But that last show was terrible. It was terrible. And they had like kind of a a six feet under kind of ending where you, you, you go forward in time and see what happens to everybody. It's, it was ridiculous. It was terrible. But I thought the Game of Thrones ending was great. Tyrion stands up. He starts telling the story about who should be king. And you think he's talking about Jon Snow. And then he's talking about the, uh, you know, brand or whatever. And I, I thought that was good. they surprised me. I was like, that's, that's great. I, I like the way that, uh, the, that the show, when you think about it, because imagine like the Daenerys had won, people would have said, this show was really about Daenerys. That's what this was about. You know, yeah. what this show was really about was about the Stark family. Yeah. Right. It is like a chronicle of the Stark family and how they changed this world Westeros or whatever. And so when it ends, they all go off on their own things. And, um, I thought the way they were going to end it when they showed, uh, Jon Snow up in uh, North of the wall, and oh, they're the going waters. out into the woods. Yeah. Yeah. I thought th they were going to, some creature would open its eyes and they would be blue. And this would be like an indication is all just going to happen again happen or whatever. I, but really what they, they just I set up that like a future of, yeah. Yeah. But they didn't. Right. So you could have a spin-off show with Arya going, uh, you know, discovering new worlds. You could have a spin-off show of what they find north of the wall. You could have a spin-off show of just of Sansa and her Northern Kingdom or whatever. And I, I, you could, you know, it's like the Tolkien stuff. It's like the Asimov stuff. Oh, they, they've never done this. You, you could do Star Wars. It's like that. The Marvel stuff. You could have multiple things going. Yeah. At the it, same it's time, like now. the Star Wars universe. I mean, you could have. Yeah. I mean, all the stuff in Essos, and then. Uh... Yep. Where um, that underneath the South Eros that they never yeah. there's all visit, kinds of this talk there's, about there's not just new places to explore there's other timelines to explore yeah you know which which is you great. can go back you know, in time forward whatever yeah. yeah and some will be great and some will be terrible depending on yeah. who's producing and who's directing but you know what though I so I'm not a big fan of the Marvel thing although I watch I will eventually watch all of those I watch I do watch them all I don't ever go to the movie theater and watch them I'm a huge fan of the Star Wars stuff so. As far as I'm concerned, they don't. They could never make too many Star Wars movies or TV shows or whatever. And I have to say, I I think Game of Thrones has the same potential. Uh, let's put it this way: it has more potential for more content than like a Tolkien spinoff, mm -hmm. you know, series of movies or TV shows ever could ever. Yeah, because the universe like is so vast. They have such yeah. A it's vast just so much better. Characters. Yeah, it's better realized, and it's. It's also better understood, I think, by normal people. Like you see the parallels with us, just as people are here historically or whatever. Whereas Tolkien is like dwarves and elves, and you know, it's it's yeah. a little it's a little goofier. You can't um, you can't relate to it as much as you can with right. You know, politics well, especially like a normal and, person. Yeah, you know, like my wife, you know, she she read the Lord of the Rings because I you know basically challenged her to, and I, I'm like, it's a better book than you think. And her takeaway from it was. There were no good female characters, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, but I, you know, like I said, like wizards and elves and things like that. That's not her thing. But I, you know, not that she would ever go necessarily read the Game of Thrones. But she really enjoyed that series. And I think her as kind of a normal person, like you said, you know, people can relate to it. It's it's 
it's an understandable world. Like you may not like some of the aspects of it, be like, ah, but I, you know, I could see it being like that. I mean, it's that it's an, it's quite an achievement. So I, yeah. I thought it was great. I, <laughs> I, don't, I, have to tell and you, I, I read I, the complaints. I, I watched it. it very differently than most people. Okay. I did not watch a single episode of game of Thrones until about two months ago. Oh, yikes. I had never watched one episode. I attempted to watch the first one and, yeah. um, I just I watched it and I like watching things like if I'm committing to a show, I like to watch it with Jess and I assume right. she wouldn't be interested in it. So I just didn't even commit to it. So yeah, yeah, she yeah. got into it. She started watching it. And then she was like, you told me I wouldn't like this. I freaking love it. And I'm like, oh, OK, let's watch it. We watched the <laughs> whole funny. thing in two months. So for me, right. chronologically, I wasn't devastated because I did not get what I envisioned of the ending. Because for me, oh. I didn't wait eight years to get to this point. Well, did you nine. notice the? Did you notice the pacing change? Because yes, it had a very see. deliberate pace, and then yeah. all of a sudden, season seven, I guess, or whatever, the last season happened. It was like, geez, they, all of a sudden, like people are halfway across the continent in one episode, like yeah, they're yeah, moving yeah. around. Well, they, like they, they became time you know? travelers. You know, they essentially yeah, became yeah, time yeah. travelers. The other thing, like Tyrion got dumbed down. His writing changed because they didn't have anything yeah. to go based on the book anymore. They were going on their own. I, I, I do think and he turned. He, he was so it. smart before and so excellent, and then yeah. he was just like. Eh. I do. I do want to tell you my the best character on that show, Joffrey. Mm -hmm. Joffrey was the <laughs> best character of that show because uh, and nobody. Well, even the bad people are kind of likable. You you could. Kinda, you thought he was likable? No, no, no. He was the only oh, okay. one that <laughs> was unanimously like, I, you would say, "What a piece of crap that piece of shit boy is," you know. And then the other. I see, one, I look um, at that. I I just thought he was kind of. Um, too simple like like no one is that unremittingly evil you know like he was just too it was just like silly evil but i think like, you know? the best part is like his wedding and he's like a royal wedding is not something to enjoy it's not your it's not for your entertainment and then you know i'm like right. what a piece of crap this guy is uh Tyrion sure. was great john snow got reduced down to a minor role the last two seasons uh, when he, it was, you know, his legacy. Yeah. Uh, the, the well, plus this issue, is a guy. He came back from the dead. He came back from. the Is dead. anyone else blown away by this? <laughs> like they, they kind of, they kind of glossed over it. It's like, it, it's, yeah. wouldn't this really impress people? I mean, you know, he's Christ. Yeah. <laughs> like he's a chosen one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Anyway, but yeah. I, I listen. I think I think they rushed it. I get it. It it could have been done better. We yeah. could all sit here yeah. and rewrite that show. Knowing what we know, well, you know, oh, that's a little unfair. Well, here's here's why that's unfair, though. You could look you could look at the show as made and say, you know what? Like, I'll pick like one thing that I thought was a little weird. Like, um, the, the one of the wolves survived to the end, and it was John's wolf. Yes, and he appeared for one second in one episode, three episodes ago. Didn't appear in the next episode. We're like, oh, maybe he's dead. Then appeared for one second in the next episode, and then there he was at the end, all of a sudden. Now, if you were going to pace this correctly. You would have included that dog or the wolf or whatever a little bit more just to kind of make it obvious he's around and he's okay and whatever. And it, like, yeah, you could make that complaint. Like, I would have done better with that. But you could you could take what they did, which is a huge achievement, and just make a few changes. If you couldn't start from what they already made, no one was going to do a better job yeah. with this. It's yeah. completely – all these complaints from people are like, but, oh, know, they, the they left this thing hanging or they didn't do this. It's like, yeah, they didn't, but look at what they did. I ask. I, I was asking somebody that was really angry about the ending. Okay, uh, I was talking yeah. to him yesterday, and I said, "Okay, let's let me ask you this question. I'm not going to defend. I, I'm not going to tell you what you think is wrong and what I think is right. But what I will yeah. say is, if you never went to a blog post review, you never joined sure. a, a Reddit community for Game of Thrones, you never watch YouTube videos where people are analyzing Game of Thrones." And you just watched the show and you had no uh, no deep connection, no deep diving into right. it. Like my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law loves the show, doesn't go and research and do, do all those things about the show. Do you think you would have enjoyed it a lot more? He goes, oh, yeah, definitely. I definitely would have enjoyed yeah, it a lot more I, because so, I would dude. have never – it would have never opened me up to they could have done this and they could have done that. I go, see, this, this is, is a kind of problem. It's a huge problem, actually. I, I, we um, we're a little too well informed <laughs> about these worlds and stuff. Um, it's it's called it's like the fan service problem. You've got these really vocal people that are know way too much, and they they and they always start like I told you. I said I said you know I told you I read the books. You know, this is what they always start off with. Well, I read the books, 
And uh, in volume three, uh, you know, in section 38, you know, Terry and blah, 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 blah. And that's not how it, blah, 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 you know, and like they can cite, you know, people, the Walking Dead people did this. I did the same thing. I read all the Walking Dead yeah. comic books, right? Um, you can see where it varies out. They vary off wildly, actually, from the book, which I think was smart. But, you know, we're, we're a little too invested in this stuff. You know, people complain about the, you know, the solo movie that they made for Star Wars or certain Marvel movies or things that happen in the Marvel movies. And it's like, guys, seriously, it's a freaking movie. Like, it's, I thought this thing was a, an incredible achievement. I mean, I, I, there are shows like The Sopranos, which was great in its day, or, you know, Mad Men or Lost, I'm trying, uh, Deadwood or Rome even, um, lot, lots and lots of great shows. You know, most of them don't end very well. Um, I, I thought this was a satisfying ending. I mean, I, I, I think we they kind did. of yes, got an ending they have... for everybody. We kind of under they 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 ended the storyline, but they also continued it. Like I would like to see an yeah. Arya going west of Westeros. Of course, she ends yeah. up in New yep. York, and then you do Arya in the city, I do. <laughs> and she gets an internship <laughs> um, at some magazine. Well, it, so <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. not the direction um, going. No, I don't think so. But I mean, the the thing is, you could do that in so many different ways. Like you can, the, and they will have. I know they have other series planned, but I mean, you could if you look at that Arya character or the woman who played her if, if she ever wanted to come back and do more you could picture something like a three episode special event yeah or it doesn't or a movie it doesn't have to be a multi-season series but that's the point like they they have this ripe world that they you know the health creative people look at it and they'll figure out which ones make sense and if actors want to get involved whatever it is i mean i i this is a, there's a lot there and i I, I I don't complaining about this. I just don't get. I mean, yeah, I, they're little nitpicky things, I guess. But listen, like the Sopranos, for example, and I know you got to go, but the Sopranos was a great example of at the moment people hated it, hated it, yeah, hated the ending unanimously. Everybody was so angry at the ending because they didn't tell you what to think. Ten yeah. years later, it's praised. Yeah, people and and honestly, ending, and, and they in say, today's wow, you know, world, it makes sense. Yeah, he, I obviously the Sopranos. It, if it wasn't the first of this kind of show, it was certainly a trendsetter and, 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 and kind of a foundational piece for what we now expect from TV. And I, I think that ending today would be regarded differently if it happened right now. I, I think, you know, yeah, I, you know, but you ending on a remember, cliffhanger is on a cliffhanger. honestly kind of ballsy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I didn't hate it at the, the time. Ending. I mean, I was ho waiting. The ending would zoom out of Game of yeah. Thrones, and it was a boy holding a snow globe. Sure. And it said, Welcome to, and in, he's in some city called Westeros, and he's just imagining all this. Or they show, uh, you know, like, you, you know, kind of to riff on what you were saying. I, I don't think Arya would show up in, in Manhattan. You know, That's Arya takes want. Manhattan or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, but city. you could do, so, well, there's a, a series of books, you know, the Sword of Shannara books, and uh, there's a TV series, which is kind of a, um, it's kind of like a young adult kind of a thing. It's it's kind of a light take on this world. But one of the things that they overemphasize in the TV series, which was kind of hinted at in the books, is that this fantasy world, which is based on the Tolkien stuff, it's a complete ripoff, is occurring in on Earth. That, that was, uh, you know, thousands of years ago was devastated in some nuclear thing where all of humanity has been destroyed. But there are little pieces of civilization poking up. You'll see a little corner of a building or whatever it is. And I kind of like that aspect of it. It's yeah. like the um, Planet of the Apes scene. Like Arya could uh, land on some distant shore and the, and the Statue of Liberty would be coming up out of the sand yeah. and she wouldn't understand what it was. <laughs> you yeah. know, that kind of uh, thing. Listen, let, let, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to make everybody in Game of Thrones hate me. Everybody, all the fans. <laughs> I'm going to get them to hate me right now with this with this end. Arya's going west yeah. of Westeros. But by the way, they adapted that from her great aunt, great, mm -hmm. great, great whatever, uh okay. whatever starks one of her ancestors she went on a boat and went off to to the west never to be seen again oh so well, maybe she'll find the people that yeah you it's know possible the stars the, she'll find the, the race of people that yeah yeah so i'm imagining she goes west of westeros and mm -hmm. there's a big storm lightning is hitting and she goes through this like portal her boat <laughs> shows up it's new york oh, city 2019 yeah. She now is walking around like a lunatic in Manhattan, in Midtown Manhattan, trying to figure out life. She ends sure. up adapting, gets a small apartment, you know, gets a studio <laughs> space, doing an internship. What it becomes that girl. And then, yeah, and then she's like, let's say she's like doing her job and she's getting in trouble because she has that ability to change faces. She acts like her mm -hmm. boss and signs off on sure. stuff. 
Like she can kill getting, people with a sword if she has to. Yeah, she's just getting in all this wacky trouble in New York City. It would like a yeah, Central Park mugging turns into like, you know, yeah. masked vigilante kills people with sword. Yeah. Just she gets all it's like it's like Dexter, but like reversed. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is how they're going to do it. I don't think that's what Game of Thrones fans are looking for. That's not the Game of Thrones? I could could be wrong, but I I don't think so. (laughs) Is that what they want? Okay. Yeah, I tried. Uh, No, I I really, I I told Jess, I looked at her when the season finale Mm -hmm. was starting. I said, this was a good ride. I enjoyed watching something with you. I really enjoy the fact that we both genuinely got into this heavily. uh, And uh, we we enjoyed it. And I shook her hand and I played it. (laughs) And then and we went off to our separate bedrooms. We off, and, yeah, our separate bedrooms, never to see each other again. That's how it ends. That our, you know our what the problem? The, yeah, the the problem with this thing ending is the same thing as uh, like when there's a really good audio book and it finishes, or a, a good Netflix series. You know, whatever it is. I mean, a, a small or big. Uh, there is such a void now, and you will never, or let, not for a long period of time, be able to find anything of this quality yes, <laughs> that will satisfy I, this. I agree with you. I will and, just say I, to people, go ahead. Yeah, you know, and, and that's part of the reason why people are so upset. You know, a lot of us, yes. this is, it's human nature. We get very attached to things. Yep. And that's it right. becomes part of our routine. I, I'm not Actually, defending the ending. Stephen I'm King, not this is, Stephen King defended the show the same way. He said the problem that people have is not that particular characters are dying or it's not the outcome they expected. The problem is it's ending. The problem is ending. You know, so it adds even that's more the problem. on top of it. Yeah. But listen, if, I, if you I read a book agree. like The Stand, you know. That's a phenomenal book. I read that. I no, but if you read it, you don't want it to end. Yeah. Like when it ends, you're yeah. like, seriously, I could do another thousand pages. Like, what's yeah. going on? And then they made it into an ABC film, and it was terrible. Yeah, it was ter- yeah, but they're uh, going to remake that, by the way. Um, I just want to say, I understand the criticism. I acknowledge mm-hmm. a lot of it, um, but I'm not. I my ups- The reason why I'm upset is more that the show is over, and I really enjoyed it. And I kind of think to myself. Oh, I should yeah. have enjoyed this years ago. I would have had a longer ride with this. I had a very short, uh, you know, relationship with yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you know what? The the way this thing was dragged out was actually kind of crappy. So it's bad enough. You do usually they would do a season, and then you know, nine months or whatever yeah. the amount of time goes by, years. and then the next season, they really dragged out the last couple of seasons over what three years or whatever it was. It was it was terrible. And yeah. the problem with Game of Thrones is that even from a season to a season. The show is so complex and it has so many characters and sometimes entire sets of characters don't get, you know, shown for years at a time. There'll be a last time on Game of Thrones thing and there'll be like some character from season one. You're like, what the hell is this? What happened? Like, you don't, you know, you you have to be a genius to figure out who everyone is. You know, I don't like the Martells. That's one group of people I'm not crazy about. (laughs) I don't like them with their fancy clothing. They think they're too good for everybody (laughs) and and their weird haircuts. Oh jeez! I didn't like the fries, but Joffrey, yeah. Joffrey, See, his his wedding like ended up being entertaining. So it was, you know, it was. He, his him. face exploded. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I really enjoyed talking Game of Thrones. You know what? We missed out on a whole opportunity here, Paul. Eight years we could have done What's a Game that? of Thrones podcast. Sure. And we could have well, made we, some you know, bread. By the way, one of the things that's actually kind of popular is they usually do this for classic TV shows, but there'll be podcasts where they go back and they rewatch episode by episode an entire run of a show yeah you know so i saw one about like the highlander tv show which by the way is underrated that's it was a really good show for the day um it's you know it's interesting um it was my father loved highlander and the lorenzo llamas uh motorcycle thing um show he would watch that on the oh yes renegade i love that show there you go my father loved renegade and high my father's a huge highlander fan I remember the theme song yeah. to the to the TV show. I used uh, to watch that crap every day. It was like uh, Renegade was on Baywatch. Um, yeah, Highlander. God, what else? Yeah, Highlander. Yeah, I mean, I I, I used to, I used to like those shows. I mean, listen, this is how we're going to announce Renegade this. Today, we but... were going to hold off on it. I know we're ending the show, but I want to let everybody know Paul and I are going to be doing a podcast about Jake and the Fat Man. No, it's going to be. Let's we should do uh, <laughs> Renegade, and we'll call it Re Renegade. Re Renegade. We could do Alienation. <laughs> Alienation. We could do because what's that guy's name? Um, Antonio. No, uh, what, Lorenzo the, Lamas. The, 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 uh, it's, it's the Lorenzo Lamas. Yeah. And then there's that guy, the Indian actor, who's like in every Indian like show where they yes, need an Indian yes, or yes, yes, yes. You know what I mean? He's always like yeah. the best friend guy. He's like the guy from Kung Fu. I love. I really enjoyed him. that show. What's that? He's like the guy from Kung Fu, but not him. Yeah, 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 
Yeah, you spell, you spell, like sometimes you'll need like a Hawaiian guy, and it's him. And you got that you same know. Hawaiian guy, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. just call it, it's one agent that represents all of them. That's why they always right. get the bookings. All right, guys. Uh, Therot.com for all things Paul. You can follow me on Twitter at Andrew Zarian. We'll be back next week uh, with more. With more stuff. Maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about more movie stuff at the end. See you next time. Take care. <laughs>